Welcome, everybody, to our weekly ecosystem office hours. I am your host, Jinx, and we are joined, as always, by the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. Uh, we'll start things off today with our community updates from Zep. Oh, dear, friends. Um, hey, Jinx. Uh, Sway, just a heads up, I, I muted you with the server, so you can just drop a note here if you need um, access to talk again. Uh, community updates from PNF. So the biggest one right now is Retro PGF has kicked off. So I'm going to drop the link in chat here. Um, but if you have worked on anything for the Pocket Network since February uh, 2023, you should definitely look into eligibility and criteria for RPGF. There are a lot of tokens in play, and um, we have till the end of the month to apply for it. But the goal here is to really see who has created um, oversized impact from the work that they've done. So, you know, for example, if you did a small update, but it seems to be one of the things that everybody's using, um, this is your opportunity to kind of collect some um, some back pay, so to speak, for for the work that you've done. Um, and I think most people are eligible in some way. Jinx, um, you know, we, we had talked about you, like all the work you do for the community and how, you know, technically you might not be a builder, but there is eligibility pass for both technical and non-technical people to apply. And so, You've been on a quick grant or you've done a bounty that's been impactful. Um, really anything, you should jump over there and check it out. Other updates. Um, transparency report went out earlier this week. Uh, apologies to everybody for being late on that and appreciate your patience. So um, we have some new systems that are in place that make our lives easier. And we just wanted to double check all of the numbers. That way you had an accurate report. Um, me having COVID and Ben being out just slowed it down. So next uh, next quarter, you'll have it on time. And uh, on my end, just noting that all of the grants have been processed for May. Um, and I left a note for anybody that um, if you have a quick grant or an outstanding maintainer grant, you should have been paid. If you haven't, please DM me. Um, in the month of May, we've had to do a little crypto jujitsu and uh, make an individual payment. And we're going to get those hedgy streams set up at the end of the month. And then I also want to flag that. Um, for some feedback from CryptoCorn, we are looking at um, reevaluating some of the grants. We're seeing that the quick grants prices are getting high, which is actually pulling a lot of money from the Dow. So I just want to flag to everybody that we're taking that into account and um, we're going to come up with a proposal for like a new structure, uh, hopefully the end of this week. So those so are the community like updates. Your, uh, your mic's going in and out pretty badly. In and out. Well, do I have to redo everything? I don't think uh, everything. Just wanted to put that out there. It seems like at the beginning and the end of sentences, it's kind of cutting out a little bit. Well, it could be me. I'm like rocking as I talk. Um, <laughs> I'll bring it closer to my face here. So uh, thank you for that. But that's all my updates for today. Beautiful. And uh, Shane, do you want to give us uh, technical updates on the protocol? Yeah. So uh, really, there's uh three main things that the uh that the protocol team is currently tackling uh to enable a, a truly open uh permissionless um uh testnet and really what they're working on is uh number one is governance params so this is the ability to uh set and change and update uh parameters um that are controlled by uh governance um so that's uh the uh so that's one of them the other is gateway delegation proofs um working on that so this is uh that enables uh uh gateways uh or i, I believe this is involved with uh delegating to gateways and then there's also some within the client itself uh they're looking into just uh, different go routine leaks um so really, those three things are what the protocol team is completely focused on to uh, be able to launch the public testnet. Um, with those out of the way, that really opens the door for folks to be able to uh, join the network. And obviously, especially the Go routine leaks, um, you know, that'll allow people to uh, allow us to do some stress testing on a network scale um, without uh, resources, you know, going out of whack or something of that nature uh, on the clients themselves. Um, and then obviously governance parameters is important just so, you know, we can make updates to uh, different uh, parameters and settings, you know, within the protocol itself. Um, anyways, so that's kind of the, uh, uh, that's the gist right now of what uh, what folks are uh, working on on the protocol team. 
we uh, are going to have a, uh, a a lightweight uh, explorer and faucet launching as well as part of the public testnet, which will be fantastic because that'll be a super easy way to um, to interface with Shannon and start getting onboarded in a permissionless fashion. Uh, we are going to look into potentially connecting the faucet uh, to Discord so that people could just drop in a uh, Shannon address and you know, you're off to the races. Um, so anyways, yeah, a, a number of things are, are in the works, but everything is all about uh, getting everything ready so that we can have a successful uh, testnet launch. Fantastic. And gateways. Uh, let's start with uh, Grove. Fred? Um, not too much to report. Uh, we're in the process of getting some additional Celestia chains added. Beyond that, pretty much business as usual. Fantastic. Porters, y'all got y'all guys got any updates? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, we made some uh, big steps on like our side with the the functioning of our gateway and uh, redesign. We'll be sharing that here shortly. Um, that's mostly internal for uh, pocket news. Um, we are in talks with another chain and hopefully, hopefully we hear back from them this week. They were looking to move pretty quickly. So if that comes to fruition, we'll definitely be uh, sounding the horn in the channel. Nice. Any other uh, gateway updates we need to be aware of? I'm probably going to have to make this a, an open segment at some point when uh, our total number of gateways expands. All right. Well, in that case, I'm going to kick off with the, the first subject that I've been thinking of or thinking about a lot recently uh, with with Shannon uh, now on the horizon for release and uh, public test net going live and that sort of thing. Um, started thinking a lot about uh, uh, node architecture in general, staking requirements and and the post Shannon economy, uh, all of which I think are are working hard to uh, sort of clean up some mess that we've had left during our our long Morse period along the way. And one of the things that I think we really need to bring back to the table and start evaluating again, probably as a priority is, uh, the Gandalf proposal by Shane. Uh, the last time we talked about it, I think that there was a, a lot greater understanding of why that was of, of benefit um, to node runners and to the network at large. I thought we were in pretty good consensus on that, but then uh, it never actually ended up um, getting passed. So um, I think Ben Van had, had made a, a kind of a, an extended um, converting point for a lot of us in talking about uh, how that changes the architecture, how it makes it more accessible, and in a lot of ways, how it makes node running cheaper, uh, given that it's it's very difficult to compete well right now if you're not running all 15 chains and multi-region, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so breaking the architecture of the network back out to one node to one chain node um, really covers a lot of uh, improvements from both internally making it cheaper and more efficient uh, and even in some ways easier uh, to run nodes for the existing node runners, but also and probably most critically in really expanding our total pool of node runners to include existing chain supporters from a lot of the chains that uh, that we support right now. Uh, we have a lack of growth of external participants uh, in our ecosystem, um, relatively speaking, um, compared to how many people are out there active for all of the chains that they're involved with. If you go to, you know, uh, a Solana based Discord, for instance, uh, uh, and see how busy that is and, and looking at other chains along that line that we support and how strong their communities are, there are a ton of folks out there that are running nodes currently for their the chains that they support that aren't participating in Pocket for which uh, adding a pocket node would be trivial compared to the nodes that they're already running in support of their chain. Um, so I wanted to bring that conversation back to the forefront 
Um, and and maybe Shane, if, if you feel motivated to give a, a you know a brief additional synopsis, um, and and also to to gather some thoughts from our our participants here um, to see how much support we have for uh, bringing that back to the forum. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, uh, thanks for bringing this up. This is something that uh, I've been thinking about more as well. Uh, Partially just because of, yeah, looking at Shannon um, and where we ended, essentially where we ended the conversation last time it was on the forum is right at that time, ARR, which was the uh, the uh, inflation cutting um, proposal was just being uh, kind of passed and enacted. And so, uh, so there was going to be a lot of kind of changes, at least providers felt that, you know, there was going to be a lot of changes with uh, kind of adjusting to the new uh, reward system. Uh, so the I, kind of the consensus, if you look back at the conversation, uh, the consensus was, uh, you know, we need to allow some time for uh, uh, there to be a, you know, allow there to be transition. And then we could potentially add a new transition, which would be changing the max chains. Uh, from there, we also realized that there would need to be an update to the chain to make that parameter uh, able to be operated uh, by the DAO in an effective manner, because basically you could change it, but there was no enforcement of it. So even though we had the parameter, it wouldn't actually create any kind of uh, effect on the network, only for new nodes. So it actually would make, uh, uh, yeah, it actually give a benefit to old nodes and make it very, very, very difficult for any new nodes to generate revenue. So um, anyway, so that's that's where we had ended back basically, uh, uh, you know, near the end of last year, um, more like Q3 of last year. And uh, this yeah. year, the patch was uh, submitted. Uh, and it's now on chain. So now we can actually uh, change that parameter and have it be enforced. Um, so H5Law did a great job uh, of literally doing that in a matter of uh, an afternoon. And then obviously there was a lot of a, a bunch of back and forth to make sure it was, it was done the right way. But he did it in literally a matter of 20 minutes. And so kudos to him for being uh, jumping in like that and uh, uh, creating the on chain. Uh, or, or yeah, creating the on oh, no, no, no. uh anyway, so that's where we're that that's where we're at in terms of uh where we can now evaluate, okay, is it the right time to bring Gandalf to bring a uh, max chains of one to uh to Morse? And I think I think we are hitting that right season now. Um there there was already uh adjustment for ARR, which was the the concern before. Um, and now that we have it patched, there is really no reason we we, we uh, can't change it. Um, the benefits of changing it now are actually Shannon related because it would allow the network to have a transition of going from 15 chains to one chain. Um, this will be a transition for gateways. It'll be a transition for um, uh, suppliers. It'll be a transition for everyone. But the benefit of this is by doing it now in Morse, uh, we can actually have all that kind of figured out and all the infrastructure kind of lined up for that um, and the QoS lined up for that prior to hitting Shannon. Uh, if we try to do this with Shannon, that just makes Shannon a bit of a test net because you know we're we're now turning the whole network. Uh, not only is Shannon itself changing so many things, uh, but then on top of that, we uh, uh, the the network would also have to figure out how to operate on a one chain uh, per node, uh, one chain per stake, I should say, um, system versus a one chain to, or one stake to 15 chains. So it, it definitely makes logical sense to me to do this now uh, or you know in the relative near future. Uh, and as things you mentioned, they would also open the door to a lot more node runners potentially joining the network. Um, because, hey, people in Solana that are running Solana nodes, no reason why uh, they shouldn't be able to, to join Pocket. And and especially with, uh, uh, it would actually create a lot of balance in rewards too, uh, which is which is actually a cool, uh, a cool thing as well. Um, it could create a lot of balance because people that are balanced are uh, uh, likely going to be generating the most um, uh, 
uh, the most rewards uh, and people are incentivized to create balance in the network. So there's a lot of benefits uh, overall to, to this kind of system uh, in our ecosystem. And yeah. Other thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I would be interested to hear if there's any, uh, you know, if, if people have any thoughts on uh, positive or possible objections uh, to it. Um, that, you know, that would it would be awesome to be able to just talk about being talk about it in a, you know, a form like this uh, as well before really hitting it to the form. Yeah, I mean, in, in my mind, there's there's two sides of it, right? And and one is. Um, do we agree from a high level conceptual and architectural perspective um, that this is uh, the right uh, approach to how we grow and, and diversify the network and, and really achieve what uh, people describe as meaningful decentralization, right? Uh, a lot of the, the changes that we've seen uh, in the past year uh, especially some of the more painful ones from the perspective of drawdowns on rewards and things along that line, um, created these uh, sort of micro events where uh, the larger node runners were more capable of, of weathering that change, uh, and it made it a little more challenging for some of the smaller ones along the way. Um, and uh, I think this change in particular starts to reverse that uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, helping encourage a, a more diverse environment. But then, too, also, if if that's the right implementation uh, with one node to one chain, or if there is some different approach that might accomplish similar things uh, that that is implemented in a slightly different way. Uh, Zatara asked, Shane, can you explain what you mean by balance? Uh, and Shane said, it creates more balance because if a chain has too many nodes staked to it, it will have meaningfully less rewards than a chain that is under provisioned. Yes. Um, so essentially right now, um, everyone is more or less going with the top 15 chains by volume, um, except for some folks who are um, playing with the math on um, like under supported chains and their ratio. Olshansky, was that a hand up as in you had something to add? Yeah, I actually wanted to throw out a question. So and I know we uh, kind of opened up the door, opened the floor for other people um, to come up with their objections. But I think the issue is, um, myself included, we just haven't had a lot of time to think through it right? as much as you are focused on a day to day. And personally, I think that change makes sense as well. But I'm going to put you on the spot, Shane. If you were to steal man the other side of the argument, uh, do you see any reason not to do this? Because I think that'll actually help uh, myself and everyone else in the call understand the potential downside to this if they're already. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to uh, uh, debate myself. That's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, yeah, the uh, basically the the argument against it would be it would be better to uh, uh, it would you know right now with where uh, node running is, it is a very difficult business, and providers um, you know are in a uh, a business, and we would be dra dramatically changing how that business operates because if you look at everyone's tech like technology um you know they're they're operating everything in the back end for one chain to 15 uh or one node to 15 chains so this is uh no doubt going to be a transition um so really at least the arguments that were mentioned before was was timing uh, because of arr that was a predominant understanding was was timing so uh i don't i don't think there's really any objections uh now in terms of the value of one chain one node because um as as ben van kind of heroically uh was able to communicate in the last call that we talked about this um it, it really just allows more experts to join our ecosystem uh from different chains without having to also run 14 other chains 
Um, the uh, uh, and and the economics kind of speak for itself, which is what I did put a lot of effort into the Gandalf uh, proposal to map everything out, uh, so we could actually objectively look at what the effects of the economic effects of reducing chains from 15 to one, what that would create. Um, and for a you know future proposal, I'll be updating that obviously, uh, so that you know it's all up to date with the information, but. Um, the, the big objection has been uh, that it's going to cause a transition, and it absolutely will, and no doubt that it's going to be a transition. Um, the, my thought then is, okay, well, if it is going to be an, a, a big change, you know, do we want the change, change right when Shannon is launching, or do we want to enact the change now? So uh, the DAO already voted to, um, to add the ability in Morse now. Uh, and so I would say it's worth at least, uh, you know, worth uh, moving down that path until uh, unless there's uh, a good reason or, or, or some uh, other reason to uh, to not go forward with it until Shannon. Yeah, that, that, that's a good TLDR right there, uh, Oshansky. Yeah, and I'm definitely in favor of. Uh, minimizing the number of changes all at once uh, when we do the launch planning. So that makes sense. Changes, yeah. but I also see, like, it, you know, when Shannon launches, we don't want it to be known as, you know, QoS having a real hard issue on, uh, uh, you know, right during that transition as well, right? Because again, nodes are going to have to figure out their, uh, you know, their systems. Gateways are also going to have to, uh, you know, just be aware of the transition. Ultimately, they still, you know, they still pick chains. Uh, not a whole lot is changing to them on that side, uh, but uh, but the, you know, there's still going to be transition on their side. So it, I, I just don't want Shannon to be overshadowed by some other transition that isn't actually related to Shannon itself, but uh, is actually just related to uh, something that's also in Morse that uh, if we kind of push off could then overshadow the launch with Shannon. Uh, yeah, and Miss Kitty, I see the uh, question. Um, uh, does does this still leave room for geo meshing? Yeah, in yeah, I mean, if we were to do this uh, do this transition from max fifteen to max one. That would not change geo meshing at all. Um, every, you know, basically, you would still uh, the network average would still be if you're running a chain in three regions. So it's not so where this is different, um, where geo meshing is different for like the example that we gave of like a you know a Solana node runner. They when they would come to the pocket, uh, they would still likely need to uh, deploy in multiple regions um, to get, uh, uh, you know, to, to really get the full impact. Uh, Solana is a different chain just because it's under provisioned right now. But um, uh, any other chain nodes, so say like an Avalanche, uh, you know, node were to come to Avalanche or, or come to Pocket, you would, uh, they would have to deploy in other infrastructure all around the world to get network average. Um, on most all chains, uh, you would have to deploy globally to get network average. Um, so it's it's not a perfect solution to just opening the door to having a lot of people participate in Pocket because uh, if someone's running their own infrastructure for their own service or something in one region, um, they likely don't want to also have to open up all the expenses of uh, uh, running in other regions as well. So. Uh, it's not a perfect solution to kind of that that idea of having everyone come in, but it dramatically lowers the uh, barrier to entry, and it allows potentially other RPC providers that maybe are already serving certain chains in a global way to join Pocket without having to add an additional, you know, uh, uh, you know, ten other chains or however many uh, chains they would have to add to uh, get fifteen. But yeah, geo meshing would be you know just as normal. And if you want network average, you would need to run uh, your node in three regions.
The other uh, question that was asked was in regards to uh, the, the balance uh, issue and, and um, like right now, the there is no like meaningful reason to uh, stick to underserved nodes, for instance. Um, but uh, at least compared to the economics of staking against the top 15 uh, when trying to hit network average. Uh, but if it's one node to one chain across the board, across the entire network, um, then uh, uh, there's an incentive to be part of the group that's serving a smaller chain. And if supporters of that chain natively are um, adding a pocket node to their existing setup, the economics are less for them as well. Um, so they, the cost of supporting that chain is less for uh, existing uh, providers. I think other... most of the I think most of the pushback that uh, we're going to get on this is going to come from people like me, people in the node running business. It makes the node running business harder. Um, and some people with like individual um, client single nodes, um, it makes their it makes it more complex for them. Um, currently kind of in the node running business if you're if you're a client um you just trust that your provider will stake you uh in the most efficient way um and now that you can only be staked on one particular chain um and you'll be subject to moving around uh between chains as your provider tries to optimize his overall return um, you know, you'll see a higher variance among single node clients. Um, so yeah, the, the downside or the, the objections will largely come from existing node providers that are, that have, uh, reasonably large fleets of nodes. I, yeah, I, I would say also medium and small large uh, and small node runners like myself. Yeah, there's Not probably only, like the smaller node runners that don't have much uh, in the way of labor, um, I, I think are, are probably going to be resistant just purely given um, the amount of work involved with unstaking 14 <laughs> chains. Uh, per node, and then re reprovisioning, reallocating uh, those stakes across the board, uh, and then of course also if we are looking at um, moving 60k nodes from a stake weighting perspective um, into 15k nodes, one per chain, uh, there's there's definitely some heavy lifting that would have to be done from an allocation perspective. Um, we went through a, a pretty significant unstaking when coalescing to 60k nodes. Uh, I know a lot of folks that was a ton of work and and involved, um, you know, some drops in yield um, over that period of time. So I think that there's I think that there's room for some conversations about how best to minimize uh, the impact of those changes, um, but. You know, I, I think when you really dig into it, the, the benefits are clear. Yeah, and one note on the uh, small to medium size node runners, um, where this is, where, where ultimately this will probably uh, benefit the most is actually them, mainly because if you're running 25 nodes, um, in order to get network average right now with those 25 nodes, you know, you have to run 15 chains in three regions. Um, now, with it, by going down to, to one, uh, a node runner could easily, with 25 nodes, spread their nodes across you know three different things, and uh, because they don't have to run 15 chains, they could do it on three chains. Um, so for the small node runners, uh, and and then within that one chain, they could actually have uh, kind of move nodes around uh, to account for balance. Um, you know, I like when uh, uh, 
the, and also the benefit here is the large providers, they're likely going to just continue doing as they're doing where they have to run a lot of different blockchain nodes. They already have to run, you know, 15 or 15 more or 15 plus blockchain nodes, and then they have to distribute their nodes uh, accordingly. Um, that wouldn't be uh, very different because these large providers hold a large amount of nodes. So therefore, they have to spread out across a lot of chains anyway. So there's already going to be a lot of uh, uh, large providers that are incentivized to, because uh, it's part of their service, to, you know, make sure that their nodes are properly balanced across chains and, um, you know, make a tool that analyzes, hey, there's, you know, this chain has been getting more traffic recently. Well, let me move, you know, two nodes uh, or 10 nodes from uh, this chain uh, to this other chain. Uh, and they have, you know, 15 or so different chains to move their nodes around. So for them, the infrastructure burden in terms of how much infrastructure they have to run doesn't, uh, wouldn't really change much. But what it would allow is people that don't have literally uh, a thousand plus or, you know, hundreds and hundreds of nodes, um, they don't have to have the same literal chain infrastructure as the ones with, uh, you know, a thousand or hundred nodes. So because uh, right now, to get network average, you have to have the exact same level of infrastructure for 20 nodes as you do 1,000 nodes. Now, that would change. You could, with 20 nodes, you could easily do two, maybe three uh, chains. And uh, someone could easily create a, a balancing tool as well in terms of, uh, you know, observing the chain uh, and uh, looking at uh, how many relays are on the chain and uh, doing a uh, uh, automatically switching nodes, you know, submitting a transaction to, to switch nodes from one chain to another chain um, on a daily basis or something. And the great thing about this too is, is if someone is doing that, if there's like, if, if there's really, if there's one or a few large providers that are already doing this, that creates balance across the whole network. Because if uh, one chain is over provisioned and, uh, and, you know, it's over provisioned by 10 nodes. Well, that could potentially affect the rewards significantly, even, you know, 10 nodes when you're down in a, a, a max change of one. Those nodes could be receiving a dollar or less rewards than, than uh, network average. So then a provider would go, oh, well, let me move my 10 nodes from this over provisioned chain to uh, across to like two other chains that are under provisioned. So they, for their own benefit and for their own good, they're moving nodes from under over provision to an under provision chain. Well, now anyone in that that was originally in that over provision change chain, they now get bumped up to network average once someone in that chain makes that transition. So it actually might be much easier for node runners because the large services that are already figuring out balance, um, they have to found, figure out balance in a different way but they will actually be moving for the sake of their customers. And because they have so many nodes, uh, they have to be agile with how they separate their nodes. Uh, that actually benefits uh, the small node runners uh, because they don't have to have that. Uh, they could actually just you know, work on a few chains and the larger providers are more incentivized to uh, distribute their nodes to create balance uh, on the chain that they're on. There'd be a lot of swapping around, I would assume, early on, right? I mean, just from a, a falling out effects, like there would be a, as quickly as the transition could occur. I think we would see everybody go back to all 15K um, staking and, and to the degree that we should probably also look at if stake weighting is actually a, a necessary component in the future. Um, but I think the instinct for most people would be to break those out um, with the sort of a, an emphasis on the 15 chains that they were originally staking to. Um, and and it would take that secondary effect of seeing how the economics shake out to drive staking in some of the smaller chains. Do you think? I mean, that's that's kind of my instinct. Yeah, I definitely think there will be a transition pace. And as uh, people kind of, you know, especially large providers, as they figure out how to achieve balance, um, because, you know, if, if, if two providers are both making, uh, you know, immediate changes from, uh, uh, from one chain to another chain, uh, at the same time, it could literally, you know, they could accidentally both overstake on the same chain 
and uh, uh, those, the, at least the nodes on that specific chain, will, will have less uh, less rewards compared to network average. So there, there's going to be figuring out. There absolutely will be figuring out. The question is, do we want to do that now, or do we want to do that during the Shannon transition? Mm -hmm. I would rather there. We already have this system understood uh, in Morse. And then uh, we don't have to worry about that in Shannon, and we actually just focus on the Shannon-specific uh, uh, needs and features versus also having the whole ecosystem uh, figure this out. Because part of the QoS is going to be node runners figuring out how to, you know, balance in a different way. Um, an example here is like uh, 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 let let me pull out an example here of. Uh, because I have the uh, I have my Gandalf spreadsheet from uh, a long time ago. So um, yeah, Fuse Archival. Like let, let's take one like Fuse Archival. Uh, it was over provisioned uh, by one uh, by ninety four percent. So it had ninety four percent more than what it needed uh, in order to uh, actually be balanced. Well, the effect of that was only eight cents. And so there's. Uh, so, you know, there's 133 nodes on that chain when it actually could have much less nodes on that chain, but it's only creating an eight cents difference, right? So there's not really a need to really try to balance things out, especially on these small chains, because, I mean, again, we're talking about two cents difference, eight cents difference, you know, and then maybe some of the dramatic ones are like, you know, 50 cents or, or 22 cents uh, difference. Um, so very, very small, very small uh, differences. Um, yeah, so that's where uh, with with Gandalf uh, and, and with doing this now, um, we are. It's going to be a challenge to figure out exactly how balance should be. But um, as far as I know, also every other deepin uh, trying to do RPC um, is going with you know a stake a node. Um, uh, or a stake per chain, not one stake and then 15 chains, uh, because it objectively creates the current economic, you know, situation we're in right now. The other side of it is we we end up with a lot more total nodes in the network, right? I mean, it's like I don't expect it to follow like one to one, but you know, theoretically, I think 10 to 12x total nodes would be an expectation to get back to the same level of support, right? I, jinx, I, I don't think so, but let me, can I ask for a clarification, clarification from you first? You mentioned a couple of times that everyone would go back to 15K nodes. Um, is that something structurally that's being proposed in Gandalf, or are you saying that that would be an economic effect? I, I, I think it would be an economic effect, not a structural thing at all. And, and I think that because if you are um, getting max relays on a 60K node right now staked across 15 chains, if you're reduced to one chain, like the, the sort of gut reaction there is, okay, well, I should probably break this out to get as many nodes to chains as I can get, right? I see what you're saying. I, I don't think... I. Th I don't think that effect is going to be real, um, uh, particularly for the single chain runner, which is the guy that's getting help the most here is like the Solana guy that all he runs is a Solana node. Um, he's going to stake on Solana uh, and he'll move into the, the highest bucket he can. Um, and even though we're talking about spreading these things out, um, uh if you if you have 16 nodes <laughs> you're you're spread already um so I, I i see where you're going now i'm i'm not going to 100% say you're wrong but um i don't think it's much of an effect i'll i'll give it some further thought sure, yeah I'd, I'd certainly love to hear your insight on that i mean i i don't see it being the single node guys who are joining the network being the ones who drive that I was thinking more along the lines of larger, you know, scale node runners who are used to pulling a certain percentage of um, the network traffic, um, you know, sort of default being chopped based on that uh, and, and working their way around it. 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't quite see it. And 60 Ks are more efficient to run. So there's a there's definitely an incentive to remain at 60 K. Yeah, and, and I, I think that uh, I, I do agree with Ben Van. And to add to his point, I also think that there is actually might be an incentive to keep 60 K. And the reason for that is each relay itself is worth four X. Uh, the rewards is a single relay as a 15k node. Um, so I think ultimately it would kind of balance out because you could take that 15, that, you know, turn that 60k into four nodes and spread it across multiple chains. That would give you that that could give you much more consistent, uh, you know, much much more consistent reads, but uh, or, or distribution. But it wouldn't. Um, uh, Sorry, there's there's some chaos here in the in the office. Um, but it wouldn't. Uh, but those relays, uh, you still have to balance your nodes, and according to how much relays, essentially they're you know getting a day. Um, and so yeah, it actually could create a little a, a little more challenge because you'd have to make more movements than if you just had one node. Uh, you know, so if I think if a provider already has you know 10, 15 chains, they're already on. Um, I would feel like it would actually be more efficient to keep the 60K uh, than, than moving around the 15s. Would you offer, as a node runner service, would you offer customers the choice of what chain they wanted to be staked on? That's the business model problems I was discussing. Um, node runners uh, services do not want to offer that. Um, but... I'm sure you could. Uh, the question is, who's um, who's best capable of figuring out where your nodes should be? Um, like, I could honor a customer's request to have him staked in what, in a very specific way, um, but then is he going to call me in two weeks when he's earning much less than the network average and say, "Put me now, put me over here," right? <laughs> <laughs> that, um, it's, but I mean, it's, you're going to have somebody who's going to go out there and build a, a dumb service, which doesn't really have good um, parameters. Compare staking services comes to mind um, that that specifically is just looking at, at one really core metric. And that's going to be something about what's the daily yield per node of a chain. And you're going to have people who look at that in a vacuum and go, that's where I want to be staked, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, say, to add complexity to the to the business of being a node runner. Uh, Shannon itself is going to difficult to be in the business of being a node runner. Um, but from a protocol and health of pocket perspective. I think there's just a ton to be gained by letting the individual joiners compete at a, at a level that the big guys can. Yeah, I, I mean, fundamentally, I agree as well. So I think there, I guess there will be a lot to work through along the way, but um, better to get started on on those strategies now, I think, uh, as we're entering into the testnet phase and, and um, starting to look realistically at a Shannon Go Live. I would love to see as much of the old um, kludginess as possible uh, uh, nailed down here and not carried forward. Well, I didn't really expect that segment to take that long, but it's obviously an important one. We are coming up on the top of the hour now. Any final thoughts on that or final inputs or any other questions that need to be answered? For node runners who are currently running nodes in one region rather than all three, would it make sense to start the process of segregating the chain IDs? based on regions before implementing Gandalf, e.g. 0021 US. Uh, that way a node runner can only focus on the daily average for US. 
I mean, to me, that makes sense. I, I know a few folks that would probably love to get a head start on not dealing with multiple multi-region, um, especially some of the smaller folks. Uh, although that would probably mean taking a, a short-term loss on total yield in the meantime. I guess it'd be a matter of, are we talking sysadmins of private pocket node networks or uh, commercial providers who have an incentive to stay um, staked as is until last minute? Yeah, I, I personally don't think that uh, on-chain um, on chain kind of geo regions is uh, what we should do with um, with Morse. Uh, you know, a little, we, I also don't think we want to do too many transitions all at once, uh, even within Morse. And uh, you know, there would be a lot of work that would have to go into changing how app stakes work as well um, to uh, to allow for this. Um, yeah, so th th this would be, you know, and and gateways themselves, uh, there's nothing really enforcing them from doing a, you know, from taking a U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. relay chain ID and, um, you know, allowing nodes from any region to serve it. There, there, there's nothing like preventing that directly. So gateways would have to dramatically change how they do sessions. Uh, in in uh, Phantom, uh and actually part of like the original V1 vision was uh, to have you know VO regions so that uh, apps are literally connected to only nodes in their uh, in their specific region and they're not actually you know so like a local wallet is not actually connected to uh, nodes quote all around the world they're actually connected to nodes in their own region. Um, and it would allow watchers to do real QoS checks on nodes in a particular region versus trying to do QoS checks uh, from like to a node across the world, which is not going to be accurate because of how much distance it has to travel. So watchers actually need to be able to do QoS in a particular region to really be able to verify that node. Um, so what I'm saying though is, uh, you know, in kind of the the V1, it's always been discussed the idea of geo, uh, like having these regions that you basically stake in, which is essentially what you're getting to breezy. Um, but that implementation would have to happen in Shannon um, because, again, it would change the way that nodes or that gateways uh, operate with sessions. But that's already changing in Shannon anyway, so there wouldn't need to be a massive change in that. Uh, in Morse, um, that would I would argue that would make more sense to do in uh, in Finn because they're already updating uh, how sessions work in general. So just adding you know regions is is not a is not a big deal. Yeah. Well, I want to remind everybody that, uh, oh, uh, for the curious reader, uh, Ramiro did an in-depth analysis when it came out on multi-single uh, geo configs. Um, link is in the sidebar. It's in the forum. I uh, encourage you to check that out. Also, a reminder that the extended uh, office hours call is this afternoon from 4 to 6 p.m. That is a completely open, unagended, hangout and shoot the breeze kind of call. So. I uh, encourage you to join that if you have any questions or theories or um, something that you thought was just dumb but wanted to have a couple people uh, uh, listen to or talk about. Um, you are welcome to bring it up there. And from what I understand, Shane will be there this afternoon as well. So uh, should be a good time if you are a pocket nerd. Um, what's the answer to Tracy's question? How would Gandalf affect validators? I mean, it it, it doesn't really from an architectural perspective. Um, would we see the min for validators increase based on that idea? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I, I can't figure out a mechanism that, that would cause that to increase. Uh, if anybody else has an idea on that, feel free to jump in, but, um, we are going to do this anyway to handle assigning different RTTMs for different chains anyways, or is that plan dead? That plan is definitely not dead. Um, 
but I think that there's going to be a lot of um, sort of moving around uh, as the chains settle, um, probably before our TTMs are are meaningfully used. I would expect uh, there has to be data around how to assign those RTTMs. I don't really see that being generated until there's uh, some measured usage and uh, a fairly settled distribution. Yeah, um, in terms of RTTMs within Morse, I I know there's been talk about you know maybe selective chains uh, changing the RTTM, uh, uh, like if it's a exceptionally rare case of um, uh, of a uh, uh, of a you know chain that maybe could have more. I think the RTTM per chain it really is more for other data sources that aren't blockchain um, RPC. So this is where LLMs come in. Uh, you know you can have custom on one on data sources that are completely different. When you get into the blockchain RPC realm, uh, actually Gandalf will uh, chains that are under provisioned uh, will be making significantly more than the uh, chains that are either balanced or um, uh, under provisioned. So there will be a, nat a natural balancing across the ecosystem uh, will be seen much more clearly and felt much more clearly than how it is today. Uh, um, how it is today is if we were to take one chain and say, hey, what's the RTTM for this? Um, all of the what you're essentially doing is you're actually, if we were to take one chain and, and boost its RTTM, every time you boost an RTTM, you're literally taking tokens away from all the other chains and you're giving it to that same. Um, that's what's happening every single time you do that. So if like one provider is staked on, you know, predominantly staked on one chain, just doing a slight change would actually dramatically increase their rewards and it would decrease everyone else's rewards. So, um, yeah, so trying to do that on a per chain basis, like in, especially in a manual sense, uh, yeah, very, very unlikely. I would, I would imagine this doing that in Morse because talk about infighting, that would create huge, you know, areas of, of issues because then everyone's vying for their chains to increase in rewards. With things like LLMs, which are completely different from blockchain RPC, I could see you know, having a dedicated uh, RTTM that's potentially higher uh, to account for it being a completely different <laughs> type of data. Uh, so red one, uh, uh, you're uh, uh, okay. Thanks. Um, anyways, that yeah, that's 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 my thoughts there. The uh, I will say uh, that I am working on the tokenomic stuff that I'm working with. Uh, I do have a uh, basically a working model, an MVP model um, that's kind of being reviewed right now. I'm, I'm cleaning up some things. I'm going to be sharing it uh, shortly with folks. Um, but in that, it actually does have RTTMs adjusting kind of natively um, within it, depending on how under-provisioned or over-provisioned it is. So that's actually kind of cool um, that RTTMs will naturally uh, uh, change in the, uh, in the protocol and uh, potentially in the future. So that's at least what I'm going to be advocating for. Nice. Well, hopefully that answered everybody's questions to some general degree. And of course, uh, you're welcome to come back in this afternoon at 4 p.m. to talk about that some more if you'd like. In the meantime, that's all for this call. And we will see you next time, uh, uh, next week, same channel, uh, same time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.